Well, welcome back uh, after a long summer. Um, and thank you, Christine, uh, for those uh, introductory remarks. Um, we have a wonderful um, session for you this lunchtime. Um, Emilio Wingo Bearskin is currently an associate professor of studio art at Vanderbilt, where she teaches video and performance art. Well, she was originally trained as an opera singer at the Eastman Conservatory of Music in New York and completed her undergraduate degree at George Mason University. There, she studied sculpture and time-based art and received her BAIS in performance art. And later, she completed an MFA in transmedia, a lot of words that I've never heard of, actually. <laughs> Um, or time-based art um, at the University of Texas at Austin. She was in the group show Art in the Age of the Internet at the Chelsea Art Museum in 2007. She's been a featured video and performance artist at Basel in Miami, uh, Scope at the Lincoln Center and other art fairs. She's been an artist at large for something called the Perpetual Art Machine. It's kind of scary. I'm <laughs> and I think she's done a lot of work, um, a lot of performances in um, Asian performance festivals. Uh, she was at the 10th annual Open Art Performance Art Festival in Beijing, in China. Uh, she was uh, at the Performance Art Network Pan Asia in Seoul in South Korea, the uh, Tama Tupada 2010 Media and Performance Festival in the Philippines, and she took part in the Huang Shu International Human Rights Performance Art Festival in Huang Shu, South Korea. Um, has that happened? No, it hasn't. That's about to happen. Okay. Um, Professor Winger Beskin is a, is a new media artist. I don't mean that she's an, a new media artist. She's an artist of new media. That's what I meant. <laughs> Very much at home in sound and in video and the international world opened up by the web. She's also a performance artist, choreographing the images of, of others such as Mia Farrow and starring in her own videos. Many of these pieces can be viewed online. They are consistently witty, playful, and mysterious. Even the titles are intriguing, like Ambien Transformation. I think she was on Ambien. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and Sleepwalking. And she, she says this, this was filmed without her knowing it. Yeah, I don't know how that can happen. Um, I mean, like you leave the camera on and then you sleepwalk and the end of the, this would be a great way to earn a living, wouldn't it? I mean, just <laughs> let the camera do the work for you. And then there's uh, Ness and Dorma, The Transformation of Mia Faro, Come Away With Me to the Deep Blue Sea, Johnny, My Love, Unusual Sympathy, and I'm Following the River Down the Highway to the Cradle of the Civil War. These are all titles of um, short video works that you can see uh, if you have a computer. Her current solo show, Transformation Opera, is on at Antenna in Chicago until later this month. And I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that Amelia is editor-in-chief of a new online arts publication, Art, Art, Zine, Zine, Zine. Please welcome Amelia Winger Beskin, who's going to give you a very interesting lunchtime. will begin shortly. Please take your positions. The performance will begin shortly. Please take your positions. Hello. 
Today we are going to show the audience how to cry on cue. Performer, have you tried this out before? There are many methods to cry on cue for theater, TV, movies, and performance art. The most famous would be the Stanislavski method of acting. We will try to make the performer cry by invoking her real emotions. The performer will think of something from their real life that makes them sad, and then they will cry. Very good. Those are real tears. Next is staring at a bright light and making the eyes water technique. This is very simple as there are many bright lights on movie sets and in theater. This is also simple for performance art. This is what projectors are for. See, those are real tears, but just a physical response, not emotional tears. If the performer has been unsuccessful with the previous techniques, we will move on to more aggressive techniques. It is suggested to slap a performer hard across the face in order to make them cry. This must be done by surprise. Come up to the stage and slap the performer. But you must surprise them. Do not let the performer know you are going to slap them. Very good. See, those are real tears. <laughs> Next, we will move on to more tricks of the trade. This is Vicks Vapor Rub, as made famous on the internet recently when Glenn Beck used it during a photo shoot to cry on cue. Like other actors and celebrities, one can use a Q-tip and dip it into the jar, then rub some under the eyes or onto the cheeks, and then the tears will well up from the camouflage in the ointment. Those are real tears, but from a chemical reaction. Next, we have something you can buy at any drugstore, saline-based artificial tears. Simply hold the bottle over the eyes and pour the solution into the eyes, creating real-looking artificial tears. This is useful when you can walk on stage crying or in a film when you can cut and then pour the tears in your eyes and continue filming. This is not, however, suggested for live performance art. Those are not real tears. Next, we have Krylon Artificial Sweat and Tear Solution, a silicone-based tear solution that can be used for sweat or tears. It is much thicker than the saline-based artificial tears and can last longer. It does not go in the eyes, but around the eyes to create a tear-stained face or applied as sweat. This works perfectly for durational-based performance art as a performer can apply the solution and then open the gallery and look as though they have been performing, sweating, and crying for the whole night before a live audience was present. Those are not real tears. That is all, performer. Thank you for crying on cue. Now we will do this again. A volunteer must take the performer's place and show the audience how to cry on cue. Come up and sit in the chair. Come up and sit in the chair. Come up on stage and sit in the chair. Performance will begin shortly. Please take your positions. Hello. Today we are going to show the audience how to cry on cue. Performer, have you tried this out before? There are many methods to cry on cue for theater, TV, movies, and performance art. The most famous would be the Stanislavski method of acting. We will try to make the performer cry by invoking her real emotions. The performer will think of something from their real life that makes them sad, and then they will cry. Very good. Those are real tears. <laughs> Next is staring at a bright light and making the eyes water technique. This is very simple as there are many bright lights on movie sets and in theater. This is also simple for performance art. This is what projectors are for.
See, those are real tears, but just a physical response, not emotional tears. If the performer has been unsuccessful with the previous techniques, we will move on to more aggressive techniques. It is suggested to slap a performer hard across the face in order to make them cry. This must be done by surprise. Come up to the stage and slap the performer. But you must surprise them. Do not let the performer know you are going to slap them. Very good. See, those are real tears. Next, we will move on to more tricks of the trade. This is Vicks Vapor Rub, as made famous on the internet recently when Glenn Beck used it during a photo shoot to cry on cue. Like other actors and celebrities, one can use a Q-tip and dip it into the jar, then rub some under the eyes or onto the cheeks, and then the tears will well up from the camouflage in the ointment. Those are real tears, but from a chemical reaction. Next, we have something you can buy at any drugstore, saline-based artificial tears. Simply hold the bottle over the eyes and pour the solution into the eyes, creating real-looking artificial tears. This is useful when you can walk on stage crying or in a film when you can cut and then pour the tears in your eyes and continue filming. This is not, however, suggested for live performance only. Those are not real tears. Next, we have Krylon Artificial Sweat and Tear Solution, a silicone-based tear solution that can be used for sweat or tears. It is much thicker than the saline-based artificial tears and can last longer. It does not go in the eyes, but around the eyes to create a tear-stained face or applied as sweat. This works perfectly for durational-based performance art as a performer can apply the solution and then open the gallery and look as though they have been performing, sweating, and crying for the whole night before a live audience was present. Those are not real tears. That is all, performer. Thank you for crying on cue. And now we will do this again. The volunteer must take the performer's place and show the audience how to cry on cue. Come up and sit in the chair. Come up and sit in the chair. Come up on stage and sit in the chair. The performance will begin shortly. Please take your positions. Performance will begin shortly. Please take your positions. Hello. Today we are going to show the audience how to cry on cue. Performer, have you tried this out before? There are many methods to cry on cue for theater, TV, movies, and performance art. The most famous would be the Stanislavski method of acting. We will try to make the performer cry by invoking her real emotions. The performer will think of something from their real life that makes them sad, and then they will cry. Very good. Those are real tears. <laughs> Next is staring at a bright light and making the eyes water technique. This is very simple, as there are many bright lights on movie sets and in theater. This is also simple for performance art. This is what projectors are for. See, those are real tears, but just a physical response, not emotional tears. If the performer has been unsuccessful with the previous techniques, we will move on to more aggressive techniques. It is suggested to slap a performer hard across the face in order to make them cry. This must be done by surprise. Come up to the stage and slap the performer. But you must surprise them. Do not let the performer know you are going to slap them. Very good. See, those are real tears. Next, we will move on to more tricks of the trade. This is Vicks Vapor Rub, as made famous on the internet recently when Glenn Beck used it during a photo shoot to cry on cue. 
Like other actors and celebrities, one can use a Q-tip and dip it into the jar, then rub some under the eyes or onto the cheeks, and then the tears will well up from the camouflage in the ointment. Those are real tears, but from a chemical reaction. Next, we have something you can buy at any drugstore, saline-based artificial tears. Simply hold the bottle over the eyes and pour the solution into the eyes, creating real-looking artificial tears. This is useful when you can walk on stage crying or in a film when you can cut and then pour the tears in your eyes and continue filming. This is not, however, suggested for live performance art. Those are not real tears. Next, we have Krylon Artificial Sweat and Tear Solution, a silicone-based tear solution that can be used for sweat or tears. It is much thicker than the saline-based artificial tears and can last longer. It does not go in the eyes, but around the eyes to create a tear-stained face or applied as sweat. This works perfectly for durational-based performance art as a performer can apply the solution and then open the gallery and look as though they have been performing, sweating, and crying for the whole night before a live audience was present. Those are not real tears. That is all, performer. Thank you for crying on cue. Now we will do this again. A volunteer must take the performer's place and show the audience how to cry on cue. Come up and sit in the chair. Come up and sit in the chair. Come up on stage and sit in the chair. So. <laughs> Because some of us, does this work? Yeah. Some of us have been, have been crying all night um, already. Um, <laughs> some of us have been celebrating, I'm sure. Um, so I'm going to start off with just a, a few um, questions, as is my wont. And um, And then we'll open, open discussion uh, and questions to, to the audience. Um, I'm going to get to the, to the, the particular the piece that you've um, performed for us in a, in a moment. But I want to sort of step back uh, and ask you a couple of questions about the kind of art that you do. Um, you describe uh, what you do as time-based art. And um, obviously the most common example of time-based art would be music, I guess. And, uh, and you trained as an opera singer. So you're, it's not as if you don't have that sort of connection. But how does time come into your, your work more generally? Um, obviously, if it's performance art, it, it's extended in time, it takes time. Um, but do you manipulate time? Uh, do you, does your work sort of suspend time, and take us into a, a different kind of time? Does it shape time in, in new ways? Could you just say something about what time-based art <clears throat> means? Well, recently when I was in the Philippines, I was asked to, to speak to the mayor and explain what time-based art was. And um, what I said then was that oftentimes we use these different types of Ds to describe art, 2D, 3D, 4D. And so 2D art would be like drawing, printmaking, painting, something that you would see on a two-dimensional plane. 3D would be something like sculpture or installation or um, art that we encounter in our city, a public art. And what they consider 4D is the fourth dimension, which is time. So you have something that is 
up this plane, which is two-dimensional. When you add the, the third plane, that is depth. And then you have the fourth plane, which would be time. So how do you experience something that would be three-dimensional and has an element of time? And so that's why they often call time-based arts, transmedia, or 4D. They sort of use these terms interchangeably. Um, but for me, when I became very interested in performance using time, time was always a very natural thing. Like you said, I was studied as a musician, I studied as an opera singer, um, a dancer. All of these things are so connected with time that, that you don't even consider them as a musician. You don't consider what music could be without time, because music without time would be right? It would have just a singular note, and it would be flat. Like, what would be a two-dimensional song? We can't even perceive that, because we perceive hearing with time. Same with dance. You couldn't have a two-dimensional dance. You could try, <laughs> but you know, you use a three-dimensional body to dance, so you already are in the third dimension, and you already, if it's dance, it, it connotes movement, which has to be within time. So when I became an artist, the fourth dimension was already a given for me. That's the way in which I would convey the art that I made. However, now that I'm thinking more about time, I'm interested in bringing the audience into another time and space during a performance. And that time and space that I'm, I'm interested in, my, the most favorite part of my life when I was in film or when I was in theater or when I was an opera singer were those places behind stage, in the wings, right before we were getting ready to go onto stage and perform. Once we were on stage, it's like you do exactly what you're supposed to do. You have very little connection with your audience who's in complete blackness, you're in complete light. It's almost as if you're performing for your, by yourself. You, it's very hard to, um, to have an actual real-time uh, interaction with the audience. You can sort of hear their applause, you can see their faces, um, but they don't reciprocate and change the performance. And so when I was backstage, oftentimes in the wings or changing in the dressing room, we would sing for each other. We would recite our lines for each other. We would be practicing our dance steps. And sometimes we would be remembering songs that we'd done together in other shows. And we would sing those songs while someone else is dancing in the corner. Someone else is reciting their lines. And this space, this sort of no space where you're not rehearsing, you're not performing, you're just creating and remembering, and that space is what I'm interested in conveying to my audience. That, that space, that backstage space where all of us are performers and all of us are reciting for each other. Well, um, I want to ask you then a bit more about the idea of performance, uh, as in performance art. I mean, a lot of people aren't really used to this, and uh, I, I know a lot of the pieces that, that I've seen of yours have been video works. And this was really an interesting mix of a, a video performance and a live performance. And, in, you know, one in which you are the star and you also bring in other people. Um, but in your, um, when you're on screen and you're also sitting there, I have this sort of, sort of, strange sense of there being a kind of an uncanny mix between the very, very personal, I mean, this is you, and you're here, and you're maybe, maybe crying. And, and it's also very impersonal. I mean, you're on the screen, you're just a picture. And um, is, is this sort of blend of the very personal and the really detached and manipulating, uh, is this part of the, uh, of the point of what you're doing? Um, uh, and and this, this same duality between, let's say, um, authenticity or genuine feeling, these are real tears, you know, on the one hand, and mere stagecraft, like here is how we manipulate emotion, uh, this actually, this, this, this duality actually appears in the content of your piece. Uh, not just something that's generally there in any, any video work, but it's also built into the whole idea about crying on cue. So I suppose one question I'm asking you is, is your art a way of expressing your deep self, as it were, your authentic you, or is it a way of you know, hiding behind the art or is it 
a third thing, which has to be more interesting, which is putting this distinction into question, this whole distinction between the real me and the, the me that may be manipulating you. Yeah, I, I think that I made this piece when I was a graduate student very much in response to a lot of questions of, well, you know, you're a performer, and a performer is not an artist. You know, performance art is something else. And, and this really came from me asking, well, what is that something else? And, and, and really exploring, and what I, what I became to understand about performance art is the distinctions oftentimes that people would make, like, well, if you're a dancer, that's not performance art, or this is and isn't performance art. And as I was exploring and, and asking many people and reading many books, the one thing that I really enjoyed, not that I have any definitive answers about this question, maybe you would like definitive answers, but I'm, I'm not so interested in those, but what I became interested in, some of the best performance work that I encountered, at raised these questions. Rather than giving answers as to what is and isn't performance art, I, I began to find performance art that raised questions of, well, what is and isn't performance? Period. Not performance art, but you know, are we performing when we're performing our identity, when we're performing being a mother, being a sister, being a brother? Are, when everything is performance, if everything is performance, is nothing performance? And so I created this, this uh, piece really to have the audience ask those questions themselves. What is real tears? What, you know, could you possibly have real tears at all when you're on the stage? Even if I'm really crying, could it ever be perceived as anything else? When I was listening to NPR yesterday, Michael Caine was talking about a situation when he was on a, a film, and they, he hadn't been trained how to ride a horse properly, and they convinced him to get on the horse, and they said, oh, no, no, it's a very, very you know, calm horse, and it's fine. He said, I don't know how to ride a horse. I said, no, 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 it's fine. And of course, the horse bucked him, and he, and he fell to the ground. And he said, and everyone laughed at, on the set. And he had really actually hurt himself really bad, and it made him really angry that you know everyone had just laughed at him. You know, he had said, "I can't ride a horse," and then as soon as they you know convince him to get on it, it bucks him and he hurts himself, and everyone laughs. And the thing is, is in that context, he as a performer, as an actor on a film set, people couldn't even perceive when something actually happened to him as it being anything but entertainment because he's an entertainer. So I mean, can an entertainer get up on stage and have real tears? So this is the questions I'm hoping to raise with this piece. So what, one last question. Um, in, uh, in this piece, uh, Crying on Cue, you are whatever else, I mean, in the sense you're performing about performance. Yeah. Um, it's not just a performance, as it were. You're actually showing us how people um, set up a performance. Mm -hmm. And so my philosophical question <laughs> would be, um, in a sense, you're showing the artifice behind the art in showing how people cry uh, without really necessarily feeling uh, sorrow or anything like that. Would, would, would an ideal uh, work for you be one that didn't itself have any artifice in it? In other words, could, do you think you could have a sort of total transparency in which uh, there were no devices or no you know, techniques, no manipulation? Or, is, is that, or were you manipulating us just as much in this piece uh, in showing us one of the methods of manipulating the audience by emotion? In other words, is, can you imagine a, a perfectly um, open, transparent, naive, honest, non-manipulating form of art? Or is it, are we always going to use these techniques? So what were you doing? <laughs> um, what techniques were you using to get us to, to see the techniques that people use to create tears and emotions in the audience? I think part of it is creating a stage is a, a space that is the performance and then a space where there is not the performance. When I ask the, the performer, I say, and I say performer, so that anyone who sits in the chair is the performer, and it's me or it's the other, anyone is the performer. So we, by creating an actual physical space, which is what theater has traditionally done, to say this is a line, and be it past this line is when we're going to pretend, and everyone on this side of the line is going to pretend that whatever is happening on that side of the line is, is happening, and we all agree, and since we agree, then we can go forward. And so what I'm doing here is, again, we have a stage, that's easy, we all know what that is. 
we have a chair. When you're in the chair, you're the performer. And we have a video camera that then takes your face and distances it from real. And that gives uh, everyone who's watching, they suddenly focus on the real representation rather than the real. So this is the setup, yes. in a sense. Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> I, was, I was just wondering what, what you would have done if like 25 people had lined up waiting to, to come on the stage. <laughs> well, um, I have done this performance before. Actually, this is the first time I've done this in um, this way in the United States. But when I did this in Korea, um, I had a bunch of people get up to do it, and they kind of had to fight over the chair. And it was actually two men that ended up getting it, one and then the other. And it really, when we had the 25 people jump up, was for the slapping. That's when everyone <laughs> jumped up. And, and they would run and chase each other around the room until they finally did get slapped. And so, you know, I don't know. This, I don't is, know this, is, this is this is Korea, but, Yeah, we don't um, do that kind of thing. Yeah, but that was the exciting part, really. Was like they, and everyone was like waiting to slap. Because you know it's coming after a while. You know what's going to happen. And so, man, people were just jumped up and where he was getting chased by like 15 people to get slapped. So. And I liked I liked that it was two really like kind of tough guys that, that did it and they were in three piece suits and they they were really interesting. We we screened those out of the like uh, yeah, yeah we had women this time which I liked to see that. So. Okay I think it's time we asked um ask the audience um, to join in and, and ask you some <coughs> questions. And we should have some microphones. Oh she's um, awesome. Yeah, there's one coming. How would this performance have changed if it were how to laugh on cue? I, I don't know. How do you think that it would change? I feel like it would almost work that way. I feel like there's not as many devices, though, that I could see that there's a sense that you're getting insider information with. Right, that even though most of us probably could have figured this out, if someone's like, Can you cry on cue? You could have figured out these tricks. But there's this sense that there's an insider information because I have this title as being a, a performance artist. Maybe I know something other people don't know, which isn't really true. So if we said laugh on cue, we might not buy it as an audience that I might know something about laughing on cue that you might not know. And the reality is, the way I set this up is really to say there isn't something I know that you don't know. But that's the trick. And so I don't know if that trick would work with laughing on cue, because you wouldn't believe that I could teach you a way to laugh on cue, because I feel like anyone can fake a laugh, you know? So that means that tears actually are more real than laugh. laugh. Possibly. I mean, I, I feel like, we very rarely see uh, actresses getting uh, Best Actress Awards for roles that make people laugh, which is unfortunate because I, I really think that to make people laugh is an incredible skill. Thank you. Yes, lady here. In the 50s, I had the opportunity to see um, Mary Barton do South Pacific. Oh, and we were in front row seats. It was a wonderful experience. And I watched her produce tears without any artificial face. Oh, yeah, absolutely. She obviously did that many different performances, but there must be a real gift to be able to reconstruct what makes you cry. Oh, absolutely. And make the tears come. Absolutely. I, um, I, when I was setting up for this performance yesterday, I ran into Will Akers, who's another professor at Vanderbilt, and I told him about this, and he said um, he had a chance to interview uh, the woman, and I'm completely blanking on her name, but she played the young girl in Meet Me in St. Louis. She played like the, the eight-year-old, you know, so he had a chance to interview her, and he said, um, and she said, the director said to her, he said, now, we're going to need you to cry on cue in this one scene, and... You know, and he started kind of getting her revved up for this. She's a child actor. He, she's this is really her first big film. He didn't really, you know, he's kind of nervous about this. Is she going to be able to do this? And she says, Ah, would you like when I cry for my tears to go all the way down to my chin or just half way? <laughs> so some people just have that gift. Does anyone else have a question? Yes. You spoke of the, I like the image, of the line that is formed by the stage where 
we do it play like on one side and play like on the other side. But it seems to me that as a performer, there are those magic moments when you realize that the audience has entered your space and you become larger than you were. Does that happen for you? Well, I, I guess I would phrase it this way. When I was an opera singer, I, I think the most amazing part of that would be to sit on the middle of a stage in these gorgeously acoustically designed masterpieces of, of architecture, these concert halls all over the world that when you sing, you hear a thousand of yourself back at you. Mm -hmm. And then when you, you hear it, they're really designed so that when there are bodies in the space is really when you have that vibration. And I think the closest thing that I've ever come to a perfect performance is when I sing and I feel that vibration of that note moving through bodies. And I thought to myself, I want to have that be what the performance is really about, rather than it just being about my voice that causes that. Really, it's about the bodies being present that, that causes that. happened if you um, kept asking for someone to come up on the stage and nobody came forward? How would you know? You know, see, that's never happened before, but I've all, I always think that's going to. I always think that no one's going to do it. I mean, that's what I always think. I think mean, nobody is going to do this. But I like watching it with an empty chair, personally. Um, because I, you know, I do that. When I practice it, I practice it, and then I watch, and I, you know, say, no one's going to get up here and do this. And I watch the empty chair, and it's actually, for me anyways, maybe everyone would have thought it was boring. I think it's fascinating to hear it and then what happens is your mind fills in the blanks. You become the performer. You imagine yourself in this empty chair, which I think is almost more powerful than seeing another person. Is you, when there's an empty chair and you hear these instructions, you can't help but think, how would this feel or look on my body? Uh, I'm fascinated by the, the analogy to a classroom situation in which you ask uh, your, your whole class, does anyone know, you know the answer to this question? And the secret is you've got to wait. Because if you if you expect the answer in like two seconds, it won't come. Maybe 10 seconds, it doesn't come. But if you're just willing to wait, eventually someone will volunteer and put their hand up. So I was just going to ask you guys, supposing that we hadn't had the volunteers we had, and supposing Amelia just waited, how many of you, if just to take pity on her, uh, <laughs> Would eventually, if she'd waited long enough, have been willing to come up? Could you just put your hand up, just out of the curiosity? Well, look at that. I'm very surprised. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> you guys have a lot of pity. <laughs> and that's something we would never have known, you see. We hadn't asked that question. <laughs> no, that's really great. <laughs> so, any, any, any... Oh, there's one other question yes, here. Another, there, there's a question over here, this lady at the uh, edge. Mm -hmm. In the opera world, there are so many notes and sequence of notes that it make all, everyone cry, it seems oh, like. Oh, I know. I used it in, like, Carrie, Carrie Tate, kind of the four last songs of Straps. I mean, oh, yeah. I just know when I put that on the CD player, that's going to happen. It's The notes are so beautiful. I have no idea why that why I have that sort of response. But I noticed that there's so many people around the room music, if you're attending a performance, that are openly weeping. So I go up to them and invite them to join the Open Weepers Club. And that's, that's what we call ours. That is great. That is so great. No, I think music, and especially opera, is just absolutely phenomenal. All it is is a vibration in the air. And just this, and it's so, you can't feel it. I mean, even if I were to sing right at, at David in my full opera voice, he would not be able to feel it. He could feel my, the air moving from my lungs, but he wouldn't be able to feel those vibrations. But those vibrations can move you to tears. I mean, it's absolutely phenomenal. Can we try that? Just <laughs> I wish I didn't have this horrible cold, though, uh, because I, I, I do, I, might, I actually have a very high voice, but right now I have like a, it's quite dusty. I know, because I have a cold, but 
Yes. Okay, there's a, a gentleman here and another lady in the middle there. I was wondering if you could talk about some of your other performance pieces. Sure. Um, actually, now that we're talking about voice, um, I did a, a performance, and I did this for the first time in the Philippines, and then I, I did it again at, here in Nashville a little while ago. And what it is, is I, I get into a group, um, in a room, and I turn off the lights, and I ask everyone to come close to me. And then I say closer, 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 until I'm really pulling people so that we're like a little smashed amoeba, and, and everyone is touching someone else with their shoulders. Like we're very, very close. And the lights are turned down, not totally pitch black so that people feel disoriented, but very pretty dark. And then I sing an A note, and I just sing it. And then I inhale, and then I sing the note again. And I inhale, and I sing the note again. And every time I do this performance, everyone sings with me. I mean, I don't tell them to, but that's what happens. And that's what I want to have happen. But it's not an instruction that's given. In fact, the only instruction that's given is come closer. Come closer, please come closer. Can you please stand closer? Closer. That's it. And not only does everyone sing with me, they breathe with me at the exact same time, which is pretty incredible. So that's another piece. And that one is um, just called vocal performance. There's a gentleman over here. Yeah, and then, then the lady. No, that gentleman next time. In uh, drawing and painting, uh, tradition has it that you use the real world as a uh, as a model for what you uh, attempt to uh, replicate in some form. Um, at some point, abstract art became a part of the accepted format for. Uh, for artists, and at first it was, I think, roundly rejected. Um, and I'm not sure what this question is exactly, but how does the abstract uh, dimension, <coughs> excuse me, enter into the time-based art? Was the, the example you just gave an abstract uh, example? Well, I, I, have, I have two answers for that, and I don't know which one is right. Um, You'll have to tell me which one you think sounds better. Um, in one sense, all performance has to be abstract because you are, in every conversation is abstract in the sense that when I use language and I speak to David, I'm speaking and using an you know, a arbitrary symbol and then he has to connect it in an abstract format to something he understands and then we communicate. And with performance, it's the same way in the sense that if I'm performing, you have to abstractly understand it. Even if I'm lying to you by telling you a story, pretending that I'm the Queen of England and giving a monologue, or even if I'm just saying, this line, I now I am performing, that's already an abstract thought. Um, on the other hand, conversely, people have often said that as a 4D artist, I'm a figurative artist, which I think is interesting. And they say, well, you do figurative video, and you do figurative performance. And I say, well, that's just because I have a figure. You know, I don't, but, so I, I don't know, there's those two questions as if you're using your body, can you ever abstract the body? I don't know. Yes. Okay, um, I want to know if you've ever done the reverse of cranial cue let me explain what I mean. During World War II, there was a song called The Soldier, and everywhere it was performed, you look around, and everybody was crying before it was over. Well, that was in the 40s. Since then, I hear it two or three times a year, and I say, I'm not going to cry, I'm not going to cry, I'm not going to cry, I'm not going to cry. I have cried every time. How do you do the reverse, the reverse. of crying on the cue? That's interesting. Have you ever had that? Well, what do you think would be the reverse of it? Well, I mean, if you tell yourself not to cry, and you don't, and, and then you can't, anyway. and you cry anyways. Maybe it's that you change that so that crying isn't even part of that language. That it's when I hear this song, I am going to rather than what you're not going to. Possibly. Yes, gentlemen 
You can just shout them out to okay. that big of a Well, in response to her question, um, I actually sang in Turandot. Oh, I love Mass and Dorma. Yes, yeah. yes. And so um, every time I previously heard Mass and Dorma, I just went, yes. Oh, I know. And so I just had to detach myself. My husband said, you know you're not going to be able to. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's the saddest <laughs> So um, I just had to detach myself and focus on the costume or the mask or, or whatever, and just so I wouldn't cry whenever mm -hmm. even Prince Caliph would sing. So just, that's, that's the only way to get through it, I guess. Just detach yourself. Yeah, I absolutely could not ever have emotion when I was singing no. those parts, because you're, as you know, you, there's the slightest bit of emotion, you get choked up, you can't sing. <laughs> you can't breathe. You can't sing. <laughs> yes. Are your pieces always live? Do you always have to have a live performer? If you had videotaped this and I'd watched it out in the lobby without seeing the performer, do you ever do that? Would that be different? It um, seemed to me be I do do some performances for video, but my live performances I don't show unless they're live. Like I wouldn't show a tape recording of what was a live performance in a gallery and say that's the documentation. I don't, I don't do that, but I have performed for video and then I'll show that piece in a gallery, but if it's a live performance, then I have to do it live. It is fascinatingly different, isn't it? Because if, if you're watching a video, you know that even if you don't know what's coming, what's coming is already decided, if it's been recorded. Whereas here, you have no idea, not only do you not, want, no, not know what's coming, who's going to volunteer, whatever, you don't know if anyone's going to volunteer, and, you, and there's that tension in the air that there, that there wouldn't be. It's like watching a like watching a you know a sports match after all the after the score has been completed. I mean, you can will that somebody scores another goal in the in the rerun, but then you know <laughs> it's not going to happen. Well, also there was a difference for me watching the live person and what I saw in your face compared to what I saw on the screen, which looked different. Right. And I kept going back and forth. Mm -hmm. Which I found fascinating. Which is, yeah, which is why we scale it in so closely that it does look right in that sense. Can, can you talk more about how video has influenced, oh, how video has influenced your work? Um, I did video for the first time when I was in graduate school because I'd, I'd really been a purist about performance at that point that no performance when documented by video could ever be the same. And I just really believed that. And I had rejected up until that point even documenting performances I would, with video, because I always thought that it, it changed it so much that it, I couldn't possibly say the same thing. Until I really discovered that um, you know, performing for video is its own medium. It's, it's very different than live performance. And so that is like anything else you have to, to learn it. Like, Performing in opera is different than singing in a musical. And um, so video, in that sense, changed um, the way I perform on video. The way I perform for video is very different than the way I perform live. Yes? Uh, there were endless permutations to what we saw today. And I imagine as many as there are volunteers in this room. But do any men ever get up there? Yes, actually, the first time I did this, um, it was only two men that did it. And one was... Um, maybe about 60 and the other one was about 38. So they, that was interesting. So this is the first time I've seen women do it, actually. I wanted to ask you about venues for performance art. Where do you, where do you go to do this? Well, at the library and um, <laughs> at galleries and museums. Um, recently, the, the, museum of, of, the Georgia Museum of Art asked me to do performance art for the App Fest, which is like their music, their big music festival that takes over the, the Athens, Georgia. And it was the first time they'd ever done it, and they said, okay, we want to do performance art with bands. So we want a band to perform, and then we want a performance artist to perform. And the people at the festival were like, okay. You know, and, and it was, the Georgia Museum of Art was a big sponsor of the Athens, so they felt like they really couldn't say no, so they were like, okay. And so I performed just, you know, a band came up in this nightclub and they put their drums and they set up and then they took it down and then I came and I performed and it, I mean, people, it was, I think people really liked it because it was, it was so different and it was participatory, but it was a strange sort of place um, to encounter performance art 
But for me, I've always played in bands, and so for me, I felt like that wasn't a strange place for me to perform, but it might be a strange place to encounter performance art. But ideally, I think that performance art could be performed anywhere. And in, um, when I was in the Philippines, they, when I got off the plane, they said, okay, well, what are you gonna be doing right now? I said, what do you mean? I have my bag and I'm gonna go to the hotel. And they said, well, we're gonna perform on the way back and all the artists are gonna do something. I'm like, here right now, just in the airport? They're like, no, 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 out on the street. <laughs> so, so, I mean, and, and they just kind of have that sense that, well, if you could do it somewhere, then you could do it anywhere. And I mean, we, we did, we figured it out. Have you ever done this at? Oh, <laughs> have you ever done a similar thing, uh, disguised at a funeral? Oh God! Oh. You know, actually, when I was um, young, I was about twelve years old. Um, I had a job as a funeral singer, and I would sing the Ave Maria or whatever uh, was requested for me to sing at, at a funeral home. And you know, I'm 12 years old, I have this like long black dress, and I would do this every you know weekend. This is what I would do is I would sing. And most of the time people want the same few songs. You sing like the Pia Jesus and the Raccoons and the Ave Marias. And everyone would always come up to me and hug me and say, Oh, you must have known my son or my brother. And just hug me and kiss me. And I mean, I, I was a complete stranger. I didn't, you know, I was just hired to do this, you know, but everyone thought because the song had moved them that you must have known. Otherwise, how could you have moved me in that way, which is interesting. Well, the reason I was asking, I read where um, you, if you don't like your relative that died, then you can hire That's professional great. criers. And uh, I thought, well, I don't know if you have ever been a professional criers. I should, I should do that. That's better than a, than a funeral singer, for sure. I'd much rather be a professional crier. <laughs> I might get sick of the big paper, but... I think it's time for us to be professional. Uh, On that note? <laughs> professional thank you, people. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Thank you, David.